A minister is stopped for speeding. The officer smells alcohol on his breath, and then he says, sees an empty wine bottle on the floor. He says, sir, have you been drinking? The minister says, just water. The officer says, then why do I smell wine? And the minister looks down at the bottle and says, good Lord, he's done it again. <laughs> theme of today's reading is centered on water, and we are getting plenty of it on the roof, so it's very appropriate. Water is a symbol and a source of life and freedom, as the minister aptly demonstrated to the officer. There are many biblical water stories. Water in the great flood, which brought salvation to Noah. Water in crossing the Red Sea, which meant liberty to the Israelites. Water from the rock in today's first reading, which quenched the thirst of the Israelites. And living water, Jesus promises the Samaritan woman in today's gospel. All of this is summarized by the water in our baptism and in the planned baptism of converts sitting in the congregation here today. But the converts in our parish are not the only ones. The Gospel today tells us one of the greatest conversion stories in the Bible. It is about the conversion of the Samaritan woman, but also about everyone since it contains the classic conversion elements. One, acknowledgement of sinfulness. Two, experience of God's unconditional love. Three, experience of an event that cuts to our inner core. Four, an insight at a startling moment leading to testimonial to others who in turn experience the same process. The Samaritan woman comes from a very marginalized group and thus represents all oppressed groups, including many women, immigrant foreigners, unclean outcasts. That Jesus chose even to speak to someone like this speaks volumes about Jesus. Some years ago, when at a remote Saudi Arabian oil pumping station, two people with a herd of camels came over the sand dune. My camera was rolling as they drew nearer. Then suddenly it became apparent that it was a mother and a child. Immediately I put the camera away. To take a picture of or even look at a woman is considered rude and even dangerous. Things haven't changed much in the Middle East since Jesus' time. But right here in Houston, we look the other way when we see beggars under our freeways. We condemn sexual promiscuity but don't offer loving concern like Jesus did. How often do we cut and run when faced with such outcasts? In the first reading, it was the Israelites who thirsted and asked God for water. In the gospel, is God who thirsts and asks for water. Our Creator has become man. Of course, the Samaritan woman is surprised because she is from the other side of the tracks. But Jesus pursues the conversation gently, changing the subject from water for his thirst to water for her eternal thirst. And after all, wasn't it her desire for eternal love that may have driven her to the misguided choice of so many men? Jesus offers her living water. Now, this woman had every reason to be cynical especially regarding men. So with perhaps a hint of mockery, she says, give me some of that living water so that I will never thirst. She continues to take him literally, asking how he can give it if he has no bucket. She doesn't get it. The water Jesus will give is eternal life, and she will never be thirsty again. Yet she still wants just H2O, so she doesn't have to return to the well. How often does Jesus speak to us every day 
And instead of seeing the spiritual meaning, we see only the physical meaning. When we are called to give food to the poor, do we purchase physical canned goods, or do we also serve with both our time and spiritual consolation? The eternal water Jesus speaks of is the Holy Spirit, who comes to us in baptism and dwells within us. Baptism is not just ritualistic magic. It is the symbolic sign and real vehicle of coming of God as a force penetrating every aspect of our lives. And of course, we reap the benefits of this indwelling only if we listen to the subtleties of God's call. This is not a phone call from God. Oh, that it would be so simple but a subtle tap on the shoulder, which often comes through others. Remember, he said, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you do unto me. So the tap is through the Christian community of which baptism makes us a member. As the second reading says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Do we encourage others who are struggling with divorce, drugs, or illnesses, that God is always with us, or do we just say it's none of our business? Jesus knows this woman better than she knows herself, just as he knows us better than we know ourselves. And he cuts through her defenses with a penetrating request for her to call her husband to come. He knows how many husbands she has had, and of course, she is stunned at his knowledge. Certainly her society termed her a loose woman. She must have been deeply despised by the people. No wonder she came alone to the well. But it isn't, but isn't she really seeking love in all the wrong places? People don't sin to cause themselves pain, but to rationalize that good will come. we judge and condemn people who have been married many times, or do we recognize that if they got true love and support from their community, they may be happier with living water? She is staggered at Jesus' insight into her life. She's embarrassed, and so she suddenly changes the subject to something theoretical and safe. She asks, where should we worship? But Jesus says that geographic places of worship, including the Temple of Jerusalem, will become irrelevant. It is not places which are holy, but people who use them. It is we who are the temples of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling place of Christ, not this building. How often do we change the subject when challenged to face the truth? Do we bargain with our spouse if we are asked to do something by requesting a response for them to do something? Jesus was the first women's liver. He would constantly chastise the men, particularly the Sadducees and Pharisees, the clergy of his time. Father, that means you and I have to keep looking over our shoulder. But the women were the ones he often put in the places of honor. The first person to be born without sin, a woman, Mary. The first person to be told Jesus was coming, a woman, Mary. The first person to be told of the resurrection of Christ, a woman, Magdalene. One of the first deacons, a woman, Phoebe. The first church referred to as a woman, Mother Church. And in today's Gospel, the first person to be told Jesus is the Messiah, a woman, a sinful woman, a nameless woman, a lost woman, and through it all, a loving woman. She speaks of the Messiah. And Jesus says, I am he. 
we can almost feel the depth of silence that must have followed that astonishing statement. When we see God in the sunset, or in a poor person, do we recognize him and rush to tell others? Then the men show up. They are amazed to see Jesus talking alone to this woman, a despised outsider. They don't know what to say. But the woman, filled with joy, had rushed to tell her people about Jesus. And through her they come to believe for themselves that Jesus is the Savior of the world. They ask him to stay with them. Jesus often needs to be invited to stay. He stands at our door and knocks, but he will not come in unless we invite him in. Ultimately, faith is personal. As Paul says, I live, not I, but Christ lives in me. Do we encourage all seeking conversion, even those who don't realize they are seeking it, that the faith that has been handed on can become theirs? Do we hold the hands of those in their darkest hour to let them know that God is within them and loves them more than their wildest imagination.